the international psychology? What are the factors that contribute to our migration? And in turn, how does migration influence our research? Prompted by the beauty and tranquility of our surroundings, Lips allows herself to doze up, and in her dream, Lips meets as the monkey. Shalom, shalom, may I sit beside you? Oh sure, nice crown by the way. Oh thanks, it's going to be pouring in Israel soon, and I'm going as the fury queen of international psychology. <laughs> Good idea! <laughs> I just read, uh, I just finished reading your paper on the international organizations in psychology, and learned that you served as the president of the International Council of Psychologists before. I wonder what got you interested in the first place in international psychology? Hmm, good question. Actually, I haven't uh, consciously understood the importance of uh, in indigenous psychologists until I moved from the United States to Israel. I must say that inevitably this move had a huge effect on my personal and professional life. Oh, how is that? Although my publications in Israel continue to reflect the kind of work that I did in North America, my work has really been shaped by the sociocultural and, politi uh, socio and political factors of Israel at the time. I realized that the structure of Israeli family, education, and society were so much different than what I have seen in Canada and the US. So how did this shift influence your work? Well, I continued publishing in the field of educational psychology and developmental psychology, uh, but I started to focus on these issues from a cultural perspective. It is like once you experience a cultural shift, there's no going back. I see. Interesting. I know what you mean. For a long time, I resisted including culture in my work on gender and power. I thought gender was already complicated on its own, and there was no need to confuse things even more by adding more variables. But how can you separate things that are so dependent on each other? Yes, exactly. So I gradually realized that you cannot separate two things that are intertwined. Culture is what shapes gender, and in turn socially inscribed gender roles affect our culture. Certainly, I couldn't come to consciously realize this until I immersed myself in American culture. It is interesting how I've always thought that Americans are strange all these years when I was a grad student in Chicago. <laughs> now I sometimes think that Canadians are strange. Interesting <laughs> that you say that. I spent a significant portion of my training in Canada and the US. To me, Canadians and Americans are pretty much the same. They eat burgers, speak English, and value individualism and self-expression. In Israel, we... No, 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 no. Stop that for a second. <laughs> The fact that Canada and the U.S. share a border and the language does not necessarily mean that Canadians and Americans are the same. If we take the similarities perspective, then we can say that anywhere in the world, people and their psychologies are not that much different. All right, all right, no need to get too defensive. It's January 2012, and Paula Kaplan has just returned to the University of Toronto to give a talk on her book, The Myth of Women's Masochism, to the school's students and faculty. An unexpected guest happens to be in the audience. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be back at the University of Toronto after all these years. Many of you may know me from my book, The Myth of Women's Masochism. Some of you may know me for being a feminist, a word that many in society perceive as threatening. To those I say, learn what feminism really is. Feminism has allowed women to showcase their talents both on the local and global stage. Wow, things are really different in the 21st century. <laughs> I never gave feminism much thought, but it sounds like being a feminism feminist is very important to you. Wait, who's there? Who's speaking? My name is Leo Olinil. I'm a psychology, psychologist myself. Or I was. Now I'm a ghost. But enough about me. You've, you've got me really curious. How did you become a feminist? I'm not really too sure, to be honest. I think that my feminist way of thinking is something that grew, grew in me as I navigated through my career. As I carried on with my education from my BA to my master's and then to my PhD, I continued to face barriers that I knew my male colleagues did not have to face. Observing and talking to some other women in research and academia, I knew that I was not alone in the battle that I had to fight to establish myself. To be honest, I don't understand why more women don't embrace feminist ideology, at least sometime in their career, due to the ob obstacles that are thrown us simply for being female. Unlike you, I don't know that I've ever experienced difficulties in my career that were specifically as a result of being a woman. But, you know, I spent more than two decades as the Dean of Women at the University of Western Ontario, and it certainly became obvious to me during that time that women in academia faced certain challenges that weren't experienced by men. I find it hard to believe that you never experienced difficulties in research because you were a woman. I wonder whether you were just unaware of the inherent sexism that exists in academia even today. Hmm, maybe. 
it certainly wasn't obvious to me at the time. And looking back now, I don't know that I can invent, identify any particular difficulties in my career that were the result of being a woman. I do think, though, that I was very lucky in that right from the beginning, there was a real support for me getting an education. My parents weren't very educated themselves, but they really pushed for me in the importance of getting an education. As a result, I can't remember not wanting to go to university. I was only eight when my father died, but in his will, he specifically stipulated that my sister and I were to be educated. And when it wasn't possible to complete high school in our small town, my mother moved the family to London, Ontario. This meant that not only that I could finish high school, but I could attend university. So I was very lucky with my family's support for education. Oh, Mary, it's so nice to finally meet you. It's such an honor for me, though. So, so honor for me. Though I'm sure it's less of an honor for you, since you think my work is too behavioral. <laughs> well, dear, that's because it is. You call yourself a clinical developmentalist? You need to be more clinical in your approach. That's what I told Johns Hopkins when they were considering you as my replacement when I retired. That being said, I've been following your work for some time, and I'm quite interested to meet you. We have a lot in common, you know. For starters, we both have ties to Canada and the US. I know from experience that there's not a huge difference between them. But you must have faced some challenges when you made your big move. Well, because I moved to Quebec, there was a language barrier, of course. That was one of the hardest things to adjust to. But I, had some, but I had taken some basic French courses back in high school and college, so I could get by at first. Then I had to start writing grants, which in Canada was a whole new process. Add to the fact that some of these grants had to be written in French, and, there was, and that's where my challenges came into play. Concordia was a great university, was a great environment for me, though. I got to set up their new clinical program, and I went from being one of only a few females on faculty to a school where a much larger proportion of the teaching staff were women. So while there were definitely some challenges, I was struck by the immense number of opportunities. But you must have made a bigger move than I did. Well, it was never my intention to do as much travel as I did. My initial move to my initial move to London was purely because of Leonard. With him being a student and I a professor, our relationship caused some controversy both being at the University of Toronto. He decided to finish up his PhD in London, and so I went too. Did you find there was much of a culture shock moving to London? Oh no, working with John Wilby and learning his research methods may have been a bit different from what I was used to, but the real shock came when we moved to Africa. As you can imagine, life was very different there. I happened to get funding from the institute that Leonard was working for, but the subjects I was now working with were very different than the ones that I had seen in the lab in England. The way in which these women, or communities rather, raise their children put a whole new spin on the attachment and security that I was interested in. Once Leonard's appointment in Uganda was over, he got a job in Baltimore, and so I applied, applied for and got a job at Johns Hopkins. I was surprised at how easy it was for me to find a job back in the West, since I had been away from mainstream psychology for so long. It was nice being back in North America after so much traveling. Of course, my traveling wasn't done yet. Years later, when Leonard and I divorced, I moved up to Virginia to be close to friends. Wow, you seem to have followed Leonard's career a lot. Well, like you, my motives for moving to a new country were driven by my spouse. My husband at the time got a job at McGill, and his career, since his career was a bit more difficult to find work in, he studied music, and developmental psychologists were in demand. We moved to Montreal, where he was offered a job, and I could easily find one. He ended up working at, working at McGill, and soon after that, Concordia welcomed me into their psychology department. At the time, the Parti Quebecois had passed the official language act of act, so, uh, language act of Quebec, so many of the non-francophones left Quebec. Universities had trouble filling the gap left by such a mass, such a mass exodus. So the hiring of Americans were actually pretty common then. You weren't living in Canada when you were interviewed for my old job at Johns Hopkins, were you? No, I moved a few years later. I remember the day of the interview, though. I met Eleanor McAbee the same day. It was a very memorable day. Eleanor was one of my early mentors, you know. In fact, my feminist identity was inspired from reading her first book, Psychology of Sex Differences. I introduced myself to Eleanor, and after I told her about my dis dissertation that I had just finished, she requested to read it. From then on in, she became my academic grandmother, so to speak, even though she was affiliated with another university. Hmm, I was very busy at that conference, so I, don't have t I didn't have time to carefully look at your CV. Tell me, what was your dissertation about again? It was about gender socialization of children in preschool. One Easter, I was in a kindergarten class when the teacher divided the class into girls and boys to dance along to an uh, Easter parade song. The boys danced first, hopping around the room, making a ruckus. But when the girls danced, the teacher lectured them on how they should be ladylike and elegant. 
The girls then responded by tippy-toeing around the room, pretending they were at a tea party. I said to myself, what the hell are they teaching these kids? <laughs> for these wonderfully creative and enjoyable papers. They present six richly varied lives and complex migratory patterns, which invite further exploration and analysis. In my comments, I'd like to address two questions which I believe these papers raise. First, given the number of psychologists who have migrated to or from Canada for their academic work, why have these immigrant experiences been so forgotten and ignored? And secondly, why are these US-Canadian immigrant experiences worth remembering? An obvious first cause for the, their, their neglect is the intellectual or Whig history, which was, was once common in, in the history of psychology. A historical approach that ignores social context to focus on the, the origin of ideas will necessarily have little time to devote for understanding the minutia of psychologists' personal lives, which led to their immigration. Yet an understanding of Hillary Lips's cross-cultural psychology that neglects her immigration history or a discussion of Esther Halpern's community psychology without the context of the Yom Kippur War would clearly be impoverished. Another contributor to immigration invisibility is almost certainly the all too common American arrogance, or perhaps simply blindness, to ideas uh, originating outside our borders and a preference for knowledge that is, is made in the USA. Both when American psychologists move to Canada and when Canadian psychologists move here, Americans happily embrace their contributions as their own, oblivious to their actual origins, resulting in an un unfortunate colonial attitude. Mary Ainsworth's 1969 oral history reflects this reality, as she comments on the way in which her professor Bill Glass's ideas remained less popular than was merited, or when embraced, as with his idea of the need for a parent to provide a secure base, when unattributed. In her oral history, when discussing this uh, current proposals to departmental quotas to limit the Americanization of Canadian psychology, Ainsworth comments, comments disapprovingly, you can't nationalize talent. Yet this is precisely, precisely what happened. The value of an idea was decided based on its national origins rather than its merits. Uh, many of today's papers successfully identify the cause behind women's, women's migration. While some of these reasons may have been expected ones, relationship, differences in academic specialties, and social upheaval of war, at least as often, they were surprising reasons. Escaping the stigma of marrying a student in the case of Mary Ainsworth, taking advantage of employment opportunities presented by Quebecois politics for Lisa Serbin, and political disillusionment and the desire for both bilingual education for her children for Paula Kaplan. This idiosyncratic collection of causes leads perhaps to the most common reason for the neglect. Of, neglect. Causes for U.S. Canadian academic migration are diverse and we like neat categories, or at least being able to generalize clearly. As I prepared these comments, I realized I'm surprisingly well qualified to comment on one particular aspect of the papers, the personal experience of migrating between the U.S. and Canada to pursue higher education. In 2007, I left my home, hometown in California to pursue graduate studies at York University in Toronto, Canada. So not only do the debates about Canadian similarity and difference sound very familiar to me, but the more imaginative format of the conversations prompted me to reflect on the sort of things that future, student, future students of history might have to say about my immigration patterns. This personal experience with immigration prompts me to make one simple observation, which I believe may indicate why remembering these immigration stories is so important. It is this, immigration is done in pursuit of a goal, whether relation, relational, economic, or educational, and less frequently focused on the different culture of the host, host country. Yet this new culture inevitably shapes you in profound and unforeseen ways. Yet really, this is hardly different than the influence of our home country. It is only more obvious. <clears throat> we are always creatures of place, and place and time, but this, this influence often remains obscure. Therefore, this is why it's critical to consider US Canadian immigrant experiences, because it makes visible the otherwise invisible effect of place on ideas.